Good morning, Breakfast with Bacon fans. I wish you could be here before we go live. These three faces that you see with me today are bringing such joy to my life, and they would have brought even more joy if you were watching too. So we cut out the, um, let's see, we don't do anything X-rated. We cut out the um, R-rated conversation. No, we don't do anything R-rated either. We just PG, cut out the funny PG. stuff. PG Every, fun. Everything that follows is a G. <laughs> Every yes. G. Oh, we're silly G. people. <laughs> so we I was so blessed to get these three people on to the Breakfast with Bacon show because you guys have, have been requesting it. And I know that when I first saw their faces on the YouTube videos about two years ago, 2020, I was captivated by the messages that both Daniel and Mark were doing on their shows and Christine with her first co-host was doing and I just drank it all in like many of you did as well. And that's when we learned about the coming illumination of conscience, the three days of darkness, the seals being broken. And um, long story short, I got them here today. And it's been almost three years since those days that I saw those shows. And I know a lot of you are, are waiting for these messages. Uh, so many of you are like, what's next? What's new? What's coming? And so what I wanted to bring these guests on today was to talk about recapping uh, everything that we've kind of talked about for the past almost three years, but then dealing with a little bit of what I call the waiting fatigue. I think a lot of people are going, when is it now? Is it, is <laughs> Is it going to be this week? Is it, I got my storage shed full of food. I've got my freezer full of, of, of my Thanksgiving leftovers. And <laughs> so uh, anyway, Christine Watkins, Daniel O'Connor, Mark Mallett. Thank you guys for making time to be on the Breakfast with Bacon show. And for all of my viewers. Thank you for having us. I'm honored to be here. Certainly. I know every, I know you guys are as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You've all had some big things happen in your lives, Christine. You've sent a child off to college, and Daniel, you've brought a new one into the world. And Mark, you just moved to another part of the, the country, didn't you? <laughs> I, I just changed the sheets on our bed. That was a big deal. That's the corners right. don't fit well. I, yeah, I, I don't know if I've ever done that. That's impressive, Mark. <laughs> I know. Did you just ask my wife. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys, this is so much fun. Okay, get serious. This okay. is a serious topic. Yeah, Stop yeah. it. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm serious. I'm just so yeah. We cannot uh, have joy into the apocalypse, right? Even no, though no. the whole purpose of the apocalypse no. is joy, and there would be no laughing in the <laughs> rest of this either. And I'm sorry, that reminds me. Of, there, there's the two prayers the priest can say in in the Novus Ordo before the uh, the Sanctus, and it's and without end we proclaim, and then the other one is with joy we proclaim. And I, I can't help but remember the one time the priest accidentally said, and without joy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, is that no. during your homily? <laughs> and the homily that day was really tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way the mass ends now, you know, the mass has ended. Thanks be, be. to God. <laughs> Which is why I love the new, so the new translation in English, it's got the new uh, dismissal, which is go and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. I hope I got that right. Is that I is like that, that is that verbatim? Like I kind of wish that was every. I wish that was Absolutely. actually the only option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish that every yes. mass and and that's that's still an option. It's a valid option, but it's rarely used, unfortunately. I think because most priests and deacons just aren't as used to it. But that's you know when when the mass ends, we are called to go out and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. We must do that. The laity. That's what we have to it's, do out in the world. It's Ita Misa Est, and it's ascending forth, but the English translation that they kept in for some reason when the mass translation was revamped, they kept, I thought, they're going to get rid of it now. Mm -hmm. Finally, we're not going to give you giving thanks that this thanks. Thing Thank is goodness over. this is over, right? That, that's what half the people are thinking, right? Or at least it's Sunday yeah. mass. Is it? That's Christmas and Easter. Everyone's thinking, thank goodness it's over, but that's that's the opposite of course is what we should be thinking isn't it thank god we now have this great the gift you know the eucharist evangelize. it's in yeah. us it's physically in us at that point still and we, we are we're called to take him out to the world apparently the, Latin the new translation ita misa s is technically the mass is and i had right. a priest explain it once saying the mm. kind of like what you're saying the gospel the mass is so go take the mm. mass apparently the, the world the new translation coming out says Go and give the world a high five 
it's, it's the modern. I knew you, I knew you would do the physical it's, thing, looking down like you have some church document. Is that the synods? Um, is that what they're working on in the synod document right now? I think so. I was reading the pencil. <laughs> Give the world a high five. <laughs> well, that's exactly what what uh, so many are telling us to do now. Just tell everybody you're okay. We're okay. Let's just hold hands and sing kumbaya. Yeah, and we're not, are we? I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not okay. No, Mark, because it's, Mark's it's, like I'm really good. <laughs> I, I, no, I was. I was still thinking about my incredible joke, but I mean, I. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's true, and I I think that's one of the key signs of the times, Christine, uh, Miss Miss Bacon. We have we got two Christines on this show, so we're gonna be Bacon and Watkins. Bacon and Watkins. If right. I say Christine, I'm referring to Christine Bacon, the host, not Christine Watkins, because Christine already knows my mind. She knows I wouldn't tell her something she already knows, because Christine knows everything. So, no, but um, no, I think that's one of the key signs of the times right now is 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 this apostasy, which is being expressed in 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 the most lukewarm terms. Uh, we have bishops now coming out and saying that you know um, um, acts contrary to the nature of our bodies is is now this is good, this is approved. We need to celebrate these things. Yeah. And it's not just one person. It's not just Father James Martin, for instance. It's now bishops around the world who are starting to do this. So it's, it's in some ways, though, and, and this comes back to authentic joy. I mean, there's, there's no need to manufacture joy. When a woman goes into labor, it is all of us know here, it's a very painful thing for that woman. And it's, it's hard to watch as a man, but as a woman, it is hard to go through. And we're at a time right now where we're going through the labor pains, but there's also this anticipation. There's something yes. new coming. There's a new birth coming. And, you know, I, I say to our evangelical viewers, I'm sorry, but this, as, as Daniel puts it, this, this eschatology of despair uh, is not right. That, that basically evil is just an increase in the world until Jesus says, uncle, ah, you know, I try, I said that the meek would inherit the earth, but ah, it's not going to happen. The devil's too powerful. These elites are too strong. I'm just going to come and end it all. Mm. And that's not mm. what's coming. What's coming is a triumph of the gospels, the fulfillment, the vindication of the gospels. And if you read the Old Testament and the New it's all over the place that the that the 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 meek will inherit the earth that the cry of the poor will be heard that the wicked will be purged from the earth and that the and that the remnant the faithful the, that word's even used a remnant will inherit and, and they will live in peace and the wolf, we just heard this week in the readings the wolf and the lamb will lay down and the bear and the cattle yeah. and and the church fathers understood this they used figurative language but they would they meant it justice and peace will come and reign on earth and this gospel will then truly go to the ends of the earth as a witness to the nations jesus said as a witness that it's true and then jesus said the end will come and that's that's so fair and you brought up the analogy that jesus uses of the woman in labor and i'll just i'm working on a post now i hope to have it up real soon on my blog i meant to have it up days ago because I have to write about this, don't I? Because my wife was just, you know, in labor and gave birth and everything. And, and it's, but, but I saw a lot of, you know, I wasn't thinking about this in the moment. Of course, I had, I had other things to focus on at that point. But so we just had our fifth child, um, beautiful John Paul. He's great. He's, mm -hmm. he's a few weeks old now. He's baptized just a week ago. Um, but the, it was um, a labor unlike any other because it was so sudden. <laughs> It was so um, unexpected and unexpected. I mean, mm. it was expected. She's pregnant. We knew that she was going to deliver him soon, relatively right. soon. But just as with the end times, so too with a woman, a pregnant woman, you know, not the day or the hour. We, you talk about your due date. You don't know if it's going to happen on that date. It could be, it could be quite a range. And I think it's very fitting for a number of reasons that Jesus uses that analogy in the gospel to talk about the end times. When a woman in his it is in labor, and I'll go off memory now because i don't have it in front of me when a woman is in labor and she's in anguish because her hours come but when the child is born to the world she forgets her anguish because of the joy yeah. something mm -hmm. like that yeah. and that's what he's talking about with the coming of the era yes we have the labor pains coming now but i think about just a few weeks ago when john paul was born we had this whole plan you know we call the midwife we always do home births uh yes it's, it's legal in new york all, and all that so it's all well done uh, we have a midwife come in 
you know, we'd call the midwife when contractions were a certain number of, of minutes apart and everything. And we had the whole plan figured out because with every previous childbirth, it's been, you know, uh, going with a certain progression. Well, this time, as I was, to, as we were both just about to say, okay, yeah, now would probably be a good time to call the midwife. Um, my wife says, I have to push, baby's coming. <laughs> so, so it's just me there. Um, and what my on wife, earth do you expect me to do about that? <laughs> in the middle, yeah, middle of the night, all the kids, thank God, they're all the other kids, they're passed out just because it's 2 a.m. or something upstairs. I am not at all ready. I'm not a midwife. I, like, I'm an engineer and a philosopher. I'm the least qualified person on the planet to suddenly be a midwife. But I did read this. I at least did read this one page sheet of notes the midwife gave us months ago. What to do in case you have to suddenly you know, deliver a child. And I had read that. So I did decide. Like, yeah, it, it was like it was right? something. It was something. But like I at least read it. I didn't feel ready because I read that. You don't. And I, I would say that to everyone now. You don't have to feel ready to be ready. You don't have to feel ready for the warning and the antichrist and, and the great chastisements. You just need, you, you don't need to feel that you're ready for everything that's coming to in fact be ready because you are in fact ready. What if you repent and convert and pray and trust Jesus, if you've confessed your sins, you're striving to live in his divine will. And we're, we're all knuckleheads. We're all working. We all have a lot of work to do, I'm sure, except the other three here. But we've got so much room to grow, but we are ready if we trust him. You've got to not approach the days ahead with fear because what you're waiting for, like the birth of a child, is the most joyful thing. God, he's got it all under control. That is really think, appropriate. Go ahead, Christine. I think that's the hardest thing. I think that uh, we forget we forget to not focus on results and we want to control our lives. We want to control the world. We want to control what people are doing. And to some extent, that's good. If we're called by God to try to influence a change and we, we have that divine calling to try to make a change by all means, we should do as much enforcement of our own as we can. But then there comes a point where we can't control the outcomes. We can't control what God's going to do. We can't control what the evil one's going to do. We can't control what our spouse is going to do. We can't control it. And we have to let go of results. People, you know, are, are storing food and then they might see that they've got a bunch of rotten food in their basement. People are storing food and they might end up saving their family with it. These are complete unknowns, and it's very distressing to do physical preparation and find out it was all for naught. But as I think, Daniel, you're saying, when we do spiritual preparation, that's never going to be wasted. That's never going to rot. That's never going to be a waste of time. That's going to be the eternal preparation, no matter what comes. And Yes, we're talking about the era of peace. We're talking about uh, beautiful things. But also what's been on my heart and my mind is, honestly, and this is tough, we have to pass through a fire and we'll never be prepared for it as much as we would like to be. But are we prepared to meet Jesus face to face? Are we prepared to get hit by a rock and drop dead? Are we prepared for that? And that is a basic, scary question that probes the depth of how our soul is doing right now. And if I can be at peace with dropping dead right now, and I'm not talking about worrying about my, who's going to take care of my kids and all that, that has, we have to leave those things up to God. But if I'm okay, looking Jesus in the eye face to face and if I have done what I can do and been who I could be so that he says, well done, my good servant, enter into the kingdom of heaven, then that is where I'm going to find my peace. Nowhere yeah. else. Amen. It's nowhere else. You use that phrase also that Jesus used in the gospel where you where build up your treasures in heaven, where moth does not 
uh, destroy or robber does not break in and steal. I can't, again, I can't remember the exact quote, but you know, I've got, I've got some tuna, you know, I'm in my mess of a basement here. You see, all you see is one tiny little part of my basement behind me. If I panned around, you'd see, sure. You'd see some cans of tuna. Like there's nothing wrong with prudence. There's nothing wrong with having some things on hand. That's, that's wise, but all of our zeal, all of our focus, all of our, um, all of our energy should be dedicated to preparing our souls and preparing the souls of others. But you said, don't get fixated on results. And I was thinking about that quote from Mother Teresa. And I bet it's coming to a lot of people's minds right now before I even say it, where God expects of us faithfulness, not necessarily success. Mm -hmm. That's all that we answer for on Judgment Day, whether we were faithful in how he revealed his will to us. We don't answer for the, the details of how that transpired temporally, all that'll be sorted out in judgment day. You know, and that, that leads to the a quote I was finding right before we began, I'm doing a book on the miraculous metal right now. And St. Maximilian Colby was a great proponent of the miraculous metal. And in researching his life, I came across the moment when he was arrested by the Gestapo and hauled away. And that's when he was eventually put in Auschwitz and he's he's set up this printing press these friars he has this massive work that he's accomplished the Gestapo come in and take him he's just dictated this treatise on Mary moments earlier that's the last thing he did in mm -hmm. that place it says as he was being taken away with four other friars he is famously known to have said courage my sons don't you see that we are leaving on a mission? They pay our fare in the bargain. What a piece of good luck. <laughs> the thing to do now is to pray well in order to win as many souls as possible. Wow. They pay our fare to bless God what when luck. you're being taken <laughs> away. What Goosebumps. luck. Mm. What an opportunity we have to pray well in order to win. And he knew where he was going. Right. Oh, it's you guys. Amazing. Yeah. And it's just so profound. And, and, you know, the only thing that I was thinking of is way less profound because it came from my brain um, is, you know, people going, you know, what do I do to prepare then? I still, we need to prepare. And so many of us are looking at this collapse of the economy that, you know, Mark, you and Dan, Daniel talked about in, in one of the seals. And, you know, a lot of us are spending all that we have to, you know, I can only afford this much food or I can only afford that. And one of the things I had said to a girlfriend, you know, because I've had to use a lot of the money and and kill resources just to do some of the things that God's given me to do in my vocation. But I felt very strongly the Holy Spirit speak to me. And then I say out loud and I'll say it to each of you watching don't worry about your 401k. Don't worry about the monies that you're losing because the Lord, I always say this. Jesus is my savings account. Jesus can take the million dollars your atheist sister has stored and he can end that like that, like he did in the Great Depression. And he can take the very little that you have and he can multiply that like the fishes and the loaves. And so God, like these three have said, is going to take care of us. He's going to lead us where we need to go, whether it's a refuge, whether it's martyrdom. Do you just, are you prepared to meet your maker? That That's what we have to do. But I'd like to kind of go a little bit more formal, you guys, because you've already been giving some great stuff. Can you take me back to why you even started Countdown to the Kingdom in the first place? Christine Mark, forced me. I, excuse me? Christine forced me. She did. <laughs> <laughs> She's so heavy handed. Like I said, if you can change something, go for it. Remember? <laughs> Who wants to take that one, Mark? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, basically, Christine, um, Christine, we, Christine was part of um, a little email group, and you, you can correct me if I get the details wrong, you guys. But from what, what I remember, there was an email exchange between myself, Daniel, and our translator, Peter Bannister, in England, who we would. He was sharing back and forth, uh, you know, much of the approved private revelation. And Peter Bannister, by the way, who does the translations on our website, um, has worked with Father René Laurentin, the, the great uh, uh, Mary, Mariologist, 
Uh, he's probably one of the foremost unknown experts on private revelation, I would say, Daniel, in the world. Uh, I don't think anybody's probably read as much as him and is is capable also of reading it in a very sensible and orthodox manner. And uh, it just the, his academic approach has been bar none. So anyway, we were sh sharing emails back and forth all the time. And we were Christine at that time was working on her book, The Warning. And so she was she entered into this circle of ours as we were oh, sharing notes with her. And then Christine said, she said, you guys, the world needs to hear your emails. They need to hear this stuff. And she says, I think we should start a website. And um, my response was absolutely not. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not for you. <laughs> well, at the now word.com. I mean, my work is based primarily on listening to what the popes, the church, uh, the, the church fathers are saying, and then matching that with the signs of the times, and then adding in, as seemed fitting, private revelation. But Countdown of the Kingdom was like, we're going to grab these different seers around the world, who whom I may never ever quote, but yet we're going to put them out there uh, on this website and let the church discern. And, you know, I thought about it, and I thought, well, St. Paul says, do not despise prophecy, test everything, retain what is good. So I knew what Christine was proposing was on one level biblical and the church herself says that private revelation, the church, the faithful know how to discern private revelation as part of, of that. But I told her, I said, no. And Christine wrote me back and she said, no, you really need to think about this. And she gave me this, this wonderful argument. I really think Christine Watkins needs to be a lawyer, but um, I brought it to my spiritual director and he said, no, you need to be part of this. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll be part of it. And and I'll, I'll just add this and say, it, it's been difficult. Uh, you immediately get stigmatized when you promote private revelation anywhere. People think you're immediately wacky. Um, I don't think they would have said that 500 years ago because the church was so immersed in mysticism and her saints and, you know, the Padre Pios of the world, which isn't that long ago, people sought after them. They recognized that the mysticism around them wasn't crazy, that it was a sign of God's working. Not today, not in our postmodern Christian era. Even some of our bishops think that if you even, I'm banned from one diocese because I've simply mentioned private revelation on my website. Well, that look how alone. much Padre Pio was attacked in his own yeah. life. You know, he was That's censored, right. censured by yeah. uh, the Vatican for a time, even. So it's it's nothing new that heaven's messages get attacked. And, and we're not, you know, I don't think any of us are, are claiming that we we know with certainty that like everything we that we put out for discernment is is directly from heaven necessarily. Right. But we believe that it's it's much better for these things to be open and discerned to bring the light, to bring them to the light, then for them to be just hidden and ignored perpetually. Like there, there's, we're all, we're, you, you balance a couple of risks. And the, when, when you one hand, you have the risk of just ignoring heaven completely. And on the other hand, you have the risk of occasionally maybe reading a message that is a good meditation from, from someone, but isn't necessarily supernatural. The bigger risk is ignoring heaven. And that's my, that's my take. I don't want to be guilty of that. So we, we discern, we discern these messages, and from them, we strive to see what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church today. Yeah. And it's a pretty clear call, and it's a pretty urgent call. That, that's beautifully said, and I'll just, I'll just finish then what I was saying. You didn't interrupt me, because what you <laughs> yes. said is so beautiful, Daniel, it was right on. It's worth it, and that's mm -hmm. where I was actually going, is now looking back three years from now, and the hundreds of letters, like I've, we've lost count of emails, letters people have sent of not just people thanking us for giving them, them information, but people telling us, and I'm not exaggerating, I've been converted through that website. God is doing something beyond just the messages. When God, If God is speaking prophetically to the church, and he is, then there's always something in between the lines, and that's called the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is something that that none of us on this team can measure. And we only hear about it now in the letters from priests, from laity, from around the world, saying that I have come back to the church. I've come back to my faith. I'm now bringing my family members. They're now reading you. This is why I haven't left Countdown to the Kingdom. And I, I'll be honest, I have been tempted many times to say, 
this is too difficult. It's too much work. It's too complicated. Um, it's much easier for me to remain insulated. But at that point, that's a very selfish thing because we're seeing the fruits. And I, I think Christine and, and uh, Daniel would testify to that as well. The, the, the fruits have been just amazing. Yeah. And if you look at how it started, that the the timing of it also seems to testify to God being in charge of how these things were happening. You know, oh, we no kidding. I looked back in my email uh, recently to, to try and remind myself of when this conversation started. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was December of 2019. We started planning out <laughs> yeah. starting mm -hmm. this. And that was before anyone had ever heard of COVID. Mm -hmm. There, We were still at that point, we were still basically in the same general era. Yeah, that that we had been for the last couple of decades. And yet we had this sense that this is not going to last. And we better try and get heaven's messages out to more people than they've ever reached. And that's what we tried to do. And I think the, the, the messages have been reaching more people than they than they have before. Uh, thanks to many, the efforts of many people, not just countdown, of course, but but we're trying to be part of that. And suddenly, we actually get the website up when the Feast of the Annunciation in 2020, a few months after we had, you know, a lot of background. Which is March 25th. March mm -hmm. 25th. And that was exactly when the whole era changed. The sea world. That was when out. all of the, all of the lockdowns, all of the, sh like, all, yeah. And obviously we can't go into great detail about some things here, but that that's when just everything we took for granted in the decades leading up to that point was gone. And we're at, right now we're in this we're in this twilight zone where a lot of people who kind of followed prophecy for a while they're given this opportunity to pretend it was all nonsense like mm -hmm. it almost seems like things have gotten back to normal and that is a lie that is a facade nothing has gone back to normal nothing ever will go back to normal this these last several months they've been like an opportunity for those who listened to the prophecies for a while but never really decided where they stood it been an opportunity for them to just say, oh, that was all just nonsense. It was all just exaggeration or, or sensationalism or just a bunch of celebrity seer prophets or whatever. That's all a bunch of detraction and slander from a bunch of, frankly, hypocrites. They, this, <laughs> if you don't see that we're still in it, that God in his mercy is giving us a window here to get his will out, to get his word out. This is not going to last. And woe to those who, who suddenly out of nowhere are saying that all is well and the prophecies were garbage because they are going to burst forth very soon. And right now, I get a similar feeling right now to the one I did in the months we were planning out the start of Countdown. Well, we didn't know what it was, but we knew that something was coming down the pipeline. Something's coming down the pipeline now. And I can't pretend to know exactly what it is. But if you look at the signs of the times, you see that it is coming. And I didn't plan on saying any of that before, but but maybe you guys agree, maybe you disagree. There's something is coming. I'm, I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering what happens when the host of your show leaves. <laughs> <laughs> something <laughs> is back. Oh, something's coming, and we knew it. Yeah. <laughs> like, Did you pick what? on me while I was gone? Just a little. Just a little. Yeah. <laughs> right, just when ahead, you Christine. said something about the world getting dark, my computer said your battery's going to take you dark. <laughs> so. I thought it was, it was something I said. That's good. <laughs> I was completely offended. <laughs> and, well, I've seen the same thing you have, Daniel, that there's a complacency and doubt and a sense of, I told you that everything was going to go back to normal and now mm. it's gone back to normal. And what that doesn't take into account is what's going on behind the scenes. And yes, it really is behind the scenes or denied because there's some stuff that's absolutely out in the open up front and evil and another i feel like it's people's psychological mechanisms of coping that's having them not take it seriously because mm -hmm. some of us all of us can only handle so much right mm -hmm. we also have differing degrees of belief in whether there is such a thing as evil and if our belief does not have if our world view does not accept that a hitler can repeat itself if if our belief does not accept that satan is real if our belief does not accept that human beings have a vast capacity to be completely deceived <laughs> 
And uh, we have the scripture, right, from Second Thessalonians that talks about the mass deception, right? Here we go. Um, the one who's coming springs from the power of Satan in every mighty deed and in signs and wonders that lie and in every wicked deceit for those who are perishing because they have not accepted the love of truth, truth, so that they may be saved. Therefore, God is sending them a deceiving power so that they may believe the lie mm. that all who have not believed the truth but have approved wrongdoing may can be may be condemned very scary very sad word of god a mass deception has come over people and unfortunately it's a bit at its height right now in that as things move forward sneakily silently quickly people are saying ah oh, thank god it's over yeah, and it's and in over. saying in saying yeah. thanks god it's over people are unfortunately putting themselves right in the hands of the next takeover. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're saying, take me. You know, mm -hmm. I don't That's... believe that anything wrong is going on. Right. Therefore, I'm going to believe the next thing. Mm -hmm. It's exactly... so dangerous, and, so and... diabolically dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the next thing? We've just heard it come out in the news. The leaders of the G20 nations all met. Uh, in the last few weeks um and they have all agreed to a digital id system that will be implemented around the world and tied to that they said will be your ability to travel your vaccine status and in that in that conference at either the b20 or g20 it was all part of the same summit they they said that through this digital id every single track uh, uh transaction on earth will be monitored. And I mean, these people are looking straight at the audience and at their, their fellow guests on the, the stage, other world leaders, and saying this with a straight face, we're going to monitor every single transaction here on earth. And therefore, what we see right in there, in that yeah. nutshell, what we see is a system that's being established, tied to your vaccine status, that you cannot buy and sell with without meeting their a standard of what it means to to meet their standards and it may not only just be your vaccine status um it, it most likely will be your social credit score so whether yes. daniel or i have posted something mm -hmm. uh that would they would deem negative about lgbt or something or or could be abortion or could be anything that doesn't meet their standard they they will we're getting to the point now where they they will have the technology where when you go to purchase let's say um uh, something at the hardware store you, you'll get a notice saying you can't purchase this because it'll put you over your carbon emissions mm -hmm. credit mm -hmm. for the month. You'll mm -hmm. have to wait a month or you can't purchase it at all because you don't meet our social credit score. Folks, look me in the eyes. This is not conspiracy theory. This came from the G20 summit. You can go to YouTube, watch the video, our seven hour summit. It's all there. It's all in the open. And and arguably. it's already happening in China. Like this is not yes. theory. It's actual. Yeah. It's just taking what they're already doing and they want to apply to the whole world. And yeah. cameras I, are being put up all around the United there's, States. There's a billion the, the cameras around the world right now. They said yeah. a billion cameras to surveil everything. And in, in older in days, it? you could validly say, OK, well, there's not enough FBI agents to you know watch over everybody. And of exactly. course, there's not. But now with facial recognition and voice recognition, you just have software do it all. You don't need a billion FBI agents. This, right. is, Our all, televisions. this is all automated. Right. Why do you think they got Alexa in people's houses? Siri, these mm -hmm. things aren't just for you. They're listening mm -hmm. to you. Right. They have to listen to you so that you can say, play my favorite Christmas carol. Right. Right. But it's listening and it's recording data. And I have a family member who's totally on the left and she's like, well, who cares? Who cares if they record you? What's the big deal? And well, you know, people have to understand this is being cataloged and it'll be put into algorithms based on what you guys just said, the social mm -hmm. credit score. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when they applauded at the G20, like, yes, this is great. It's either because they don't understand it or because they are the very small 1% of the elite who aren't going to have to be um, uh, put under the 
the system. They will be leading the system. So they won't have to eat the manufactured meat. They won't have to get those, you right. know, things in our arms that we don't know what's inside of it. Mm -hmm. They're going to be controlling the rest of us. Right. And here's another thing too. I know that, um, Mark, you're in Canada, but it's all pretty much the same. We are in such an affluent nation here. You talk about bread and circus. I've heard meat and circus. You know, we in America are so so drunk on our affluence so i don't know the words i'm looking for um you, arrogant just... on our on our <laughs> it'll never happen in america it'll yeah. happen somewhere else not here mm -hmm. look how great we are mm -hmm. you, you just quoted uh revelation 17 you probably didn't know it or, or 18 somewhere in there where it, the it holy talks spirit about, was infused it talks about the harlot who rides the beast who is drunk she's drunk on on the wealth and the lust and everything and the, on the blood especially of the martyrs and you know i i won't we can't we don't have time to get into it now but how there's a there's a similarity to the west and america and i i've done a couple writings on this and how i believe that is a fulfillment of of this babylon but you know what comes next is is this right and we have said this all of us in our writings uh, christine myself and daniel in our own respective blogs is that even if you don't believe in the book of revelation so let's just say i'm talking to an atheist right now even if you don't believe you think it's all uh, just a myth you got to admit when saint john says that there will be this kingdom that rises this beast and the people they the people cry out they say who can fight against it? Who can who can beat this beast? Nobody can. And and my wife and I had this conversation this week. We sat down and she said, well, how will we ever overcome this system? And I said, we can't. I said, that's the fulfillment of Revelation 13. We can't overcome this. We, we didn't vote for it. We didn't ask for it. We didn't vote Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum, but they're telling us, they're not asking us, they're telling us, you are entering the fourth industrial revolution. You will fuse your body with digital and biological uh, and in your, your uh, digital, biological and uh, physical identities. He said, we'll all be merged together. So just think for a moment. Here you have a system, and St. John says that the people will not, they were forced to take a mark, and they could not buy or sell without it. And so let me just add one little piece to the puzzle. And I'm not, I don't know what the mark of the beast is. Some say it's an RFID chip, and we know that people right now around the world are studying to get these chips, with which they are literally walking into a store and scanning them, and they can buy and sell with it. But there was another interesting puzzle that came out during this whole last three years. It was MIT and another group that were, because St. John says that the mark will be stamped on your skin. And now there's a new vaccine delivery system where they will literally stamp your skin, embed in your skin, not only the chemical itself, but a, an ID record of your vaccine status. Now, I'm not making any conclusions here, but all I'm saying is, when have we ever had a global infrastructure where you cannot buy and sell, which is what right. the G20 is saying, and you may require, and you will require, because you require your vaccine status to be up to date, you'll require some kind of mark. And all I'm saying is, even if you don't believe in Revelation, you have to admit, St. John here has a bit of a bullseye forming right before our eyes. Yeah. I mean, pretend, pretend for a moment it's a work of fiction. You know, we love looking at works of fiction, don't we? Of even the last century and seeing how prophetic they were. Think yeah. about 1984 yeah. and Brave New World oh, and things. Lord of the Lord, Rings. Yeah. Lord of the Rings even, yeah. Okay, so just pretend for a moment that the Bible is merely a work of fiction. It was clearly written because it's been quoted for the last 2,000 years. So that, that was written 2,000 years ago. And try and just imagine a society where what that foretells is fulfilled. I can't even imagine a more literal fulfillment of what was prophesied there than what we're actually seeing happen right now. Not, not maybe happening decades from now, but being rolled out as we speak. Yes. So if you're waiting for some sort of an impetus to believe that, that these are the times, I don't know. I don't know what you're waiting for. And I, I fear that people are going to buy into what the propaganda is going to be. 
And it's going to be that this is exciting, mm -hmm. innovative, clever, helpful, useful, cool. Uh, in Europe, you know, the people getting the chips say, I'm a cyborg, I'm a cyborg. The youth are, are getting excited about it. We're going to have fancy ads. We're going to have cool music. We're going to mm -hmm. have, I don't know, um, video games you can play at the touch of, of something. It's going to be touted as the latest and greatest. And people who are, I, I, I hate to be so pessimistic in this regard, but now, as I say this, I know a lot of people are listening and saying, yeah, I'm not going to be fooled by that. No way. I get it. I get mm. how I am not going to be manipulated. And then they show it and they show it again and they show celebrities showing it and they so, show scientists showing it and they show uh, technological experts showing it and they show happy 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 people with their toys and their food and and their luxurious or not so luxurious I don't know if anyone's gonna have luxury at some point but they have a nice car and they have a nice house and you can't get any food for your kids it's so sub it's so That's subconscious it's and, and some of it is so overt but those who aren't paying attention have no idea here right here here in Hampton Roads, Virginia, for those of you that don't know, it's this whole Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. It's called Hampton Roads, all these cities together. There is a billboard. Well, it's not there now, but about a year ago, there was a billboard I would drive by that literally said, you will own nothing and be happy. I don't know if anybody who isn't paying attention to all this stuff even knew what that meant, but the message went in. Mm -hmm. And so we are being you know, led to the slaughter take me to your leader, you know, just like the old zombie movies we used to watch back in the, you know, early seventies, really cheesy movies, but, and I drive down the road and, you know, I'm a huge, we are a huge sports fan. We got I'm right here. If I turn my camera around, I'm not my green Bay Packer, Milwaukee Brewer, Milwaukee Bucks, the Wisconsin tree, Wisconsin Badgers. And I've had it for years because everything used to be like, oh my gosh, we can go to the game. We're excited. As much as, you know, that's, I want my home teams to win. Danny and I don't have the excitement that we used to have. It's like, we don't, there are more important things to worry about. So it's like, yeah, if we can get tickets, it's, it's, it's like the Lord has allowed it to be dulled mm -hmm. from the yeah. shiny well, that it that's, used to That's be. true. And that's why I think the last few years mm -hmm. have been kind of a boot camp for the faithful for mm -hmm. what's coming in the years ahead, yeah. where if your heart of hearts, uh, sure, maybe you went to mass on Sundays, but if your heart of hearts was in the sports games and the restaurants and the social events, then you would have readily just signed on to whatever they said was needed to continue doing those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And God in those last few years is saying, do you care more about your conscience or do you care more about all <laughs> this worldly stuff that you get excited about? Yeah. And that was a test. And if you failed that test, you're not lost, but you better be careful to make sure you don't fail the next one. Because the next one, there might just be no going back from it. And the yeah. next one is, will you embrace mm -hmm. the cross? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so will you hug it? That. Will you kiss yeah. it? And that is hard. Because what does that look like, right? I mean, some of us have family members oh. who are dying and some of us have health issues and some of us have, um, you know, financial issues. Some of us have, you know, houses burning. Some of us have so many things that we say, y'all, I'll, I'll take it for you, Jesus. I'll, I'll suffer for you. Oh my God, not that. Right. I think Gotta give him a blank us. check. Yeah. Give him a blank well, check. There, That's there's, awesome. there's a reason Jesus said when the son of man returns, will he find faith on earth? And, and he also said that even the elect may be deceived. And my wife and I, we, we were praying together this morning. And after the prayer, we were talking about this. And I said, I said, darling, I said, none of us, including all of us sitting here right now, none of us can take our faith for granted because we're in the middle of what is a manufactured famine. And they're telling us I mean, these, these people, these politicians, these global elites, whatever you want to call them, you know, they set the house on fire. And now they're crying out, oh, the house is burning. And so we're going to have to just take the whole house down because the house is on fire and we just need to let it burn. It's maniacal what's happening. 
those of us who are watching, I've, you know, I've, as I've said before to my readers, I've had to put my journalist hat on again over the last three years and, and go back into what is going on here. But they, they started the fire. They're now burning down the house and saying, oh, we're sorry. The, the food supply chain is going to be broken. And, and now they're saying, in the midst of this, we're going to cut the fertilizer on the farmers as they're doing in, in the Netherlands right now and Canada. And they just did in Germany yesterday. So that's going to affect our food supply. Oh, it's too bad. You Bummer. poor, poor people. <laughs> um, so this is all coming. And, and, and now what's it? And also bird flu. Oh, you, one of your 8,000 birds we tested has a flu. We're going to have to call the whole herd. And so now we've killed more birds this year than we have in all the callings together. This this is a record we've sent. So there's that. And now we got Mr. Gates saying that we really need to get rid of all beef and we can go to synthetic beef, which the FDA just approved. I mean, people and look you at can us learn to like it. You can yeah, learn eventually. You can like learn it. to like it. And they look at us like we're conspiracy theorists. When we talk like this. Everything I've said to you is in the news. It's, um, it's out there. If you look for it now, I should say in the news, it's out there in truth and reality. But we are in the middle and see, this is what's interesting. The scientists and the doctors have been groping some of them to try and explain what has just happened the last three years, how people are going blindly along with this entire narrative and thinking everything's going to go back to normal, even though we just heard the G20 tell us what's coming. And they use the words like mass formation, so psychosis, they call it a disturbia, but we know what it is. And Christine just said it earlier in the show. It's the beginning of what St. Paul called this strong delusion. For those who refuse to believe the truth, God sends a strong delusion. And, and let me just say this. This is what's been so sobering for me this week. And I've been fighting discouragement. I've been, is that I can't change people's minds. And I'm seeing now that after three years of everything that's happened and nothing of the medical interventions, none of them worked, that people are still lining up and thinking that they're going to work. And, and losing their freedoms. And what I'm seeing is exactly what Bishop Sheen said. He said the world will be split into two camps. And we're seeing this right now. And what we're seeing is yes. good Catholic, Catholics we know who are going to mass and, and we, we, you know, they have a good level of faith totally on that side. And I know some of them will be offended. They'll say, how dare you say that I'm part of the strong delusion? And all I'm going to say is I'm sorry but you're basically signing into a global cult. And I'm not using that word lightly. This is a demonic deception. Ultimately, at its very core, is demonic. It's a global cult. And it's so hard to get people out of a cult. And this is, I think, why the warning is coming. What's the, the warning? warning? I've yeah. never heard of we that. We need it. We need it. <laughs> yeah. And that's this, this illumination of conscience because... Because people are, are these Catholics, the good people who are being sucked into this because they because they think they're doing it all for the common good. They need to be shaken and out of God's mercy. That's the first reason. The second reason for the warning coming is with this global system that will shut down all our communications. You won't be able to have a blog that's contrary to everything they say. This is all coming. It will stop the propagation of the faith. Churches will be outlawed. They'll lose their tax status. That'll be the first thing, probably. So what we're coming into is now the future. The ability to propagate the faith is coming to an end. And therefore, there needs to be a warning from heaven saying, okay, that's it. Now, now you're going down that road. You have to choose either Christ or the Antichrist. And I think we're getting very close to that yeah. moment. And all the signs, even the popes have been speaking and saying that the Antichrist may already be on earth. So we better wake up and stop using that stupid term conspiracy theorist. It's oh. such an unintellectual, dumb thing to say because it's an excuse for you to avoid Don't what we're backwards. saying to you and for you to think. So stop using that stupid term, which is actually was invented by the CIA. <laughs> right. Christine, everyone done. seems to ask you because you wrote the book. They're all like, you know when it's going to happen, right? Nah, don't know when it's going to happen. Don't Come know on, that. give us a date, Christine. Okay, <laughs> March 25th. Um, 
2047. Okay. Oh, let's shop the show. Uh, so, what are your thoughts, Christine? I mean, so, based on well, everything you studied to get that book and what the Holy Spirit was saying to you, and actually, let's get a plug the movie is going to be coming out very soon. Yes, next year. Um, uh, it's called The Great Warning be a movie and i'm going to do a second edition of the warning book that has even more seers some approved by the church with the imprimatur that spoke about the warning i found six more with peter's wow. help peter banister whom mark wow. mentioned at the beginning of the show six more extremely credible prophets of the warning so the 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 abundance of prophetic consensus and knowledge of this is astounding it's and we have priests we have father chad ripperger we have um father chris alar we have father mark beard publicly on their youtube station saying this is i believe in this I this is biblical this happen they're saying it's biblical well they're saying the, and that they believe and they're personally yeah. willing to put themselves on the spot and say i believe and and that's all of this is new it's becoming it, it it, you would never think that the warning, well, I never thought, my husband told me, you know, five people are going to read your book and that's going to be it. It's going to be this little thing. That's that's all who's read it, right? Just husbands are just, so just encouraging. Just us four here. And, Hus and I, <laughs> husbands are so encouraging. Oh so uh, I thought it was for a fringe element in the church. It would peter out. It's in 23 countries and now going to be a movie. Why? Because of... Uh, anything I did know, Holy Spirit movement, Holy Spirit saying, I want the world to know about the greatest event of my mercy since my son became flesh. This is massive. This is a moment in time when darkness will cover the earth, then it will be suddenly lit up. The cross will be in the sky from the wounds where Jesus was nailed to the cross. Bright rays will fall on the earth into every single human soul, whether they be atheist, whether they be young, whether they be old, whether they be a believer. And every single person, time will stop. They'll be completely focused on their inner life and shown in a matter of just a few minutes, their entire life in light of their sin. They will know without a doubt if they were to die right then where they would go, heaven, purgatory, or hell. They will also know there is a God. They will have no excuse of not knowing there's a God. They will have no excuse of not knowing their sins. Hence, this huge act of mercy because the world goes around saying, I didn't know there was a God. I didn't know that was a sin. You got to remove that, that, that invincible ignorance before the great events start. If I had no, mm -hmm. if I had never read a single prophecy of the warning, I think I would, um, I, I would nevertheless conclude there must be such an event. So, so at least there must be some final, final chance. God is infinitely good. We know that. And yet we know the apocalyptic events of the Antichrist and so on. That We know that they're coming because it's promised in public revelation in scripture. So what, therefore, would God do before that? Well, he would give everybody, everybody without exception, a chance to choose the right side. How can he do that other than doing it directly? He can't just, he can't just ask any one of us to do it because we'll never reach every single one of 8 billion people on earth. You know, thanks be to God that the warning is getting more exposure now. Yes. But I'll just make a prediction right now. I hope it's not true, but I don't, I, I, I think that the vast majority of people on earth will never hear about the warning before it happens. I think that the reason this is getting such exposure now in God's, in God's plan is so that those of us who know it's coming can prepare ourselves to be the new evangelists after it comes. There's every city on every village on this planet is going to need a, at least a core of people ready at a moment minutemen like ready to just explode out there evangelizing the second it happens the only people who are going to be ready are those who knew it was coming and prepared their souls accordingly or or the living saints who were just always by default ready that's great but most of us you know we can we can use this this special encouragement to get our souls ready to get our plan in, ready to be the greatest evangelist in the history of the church in that pause what mark has i think accurately described as the eye of the storm after the warning hits this utter inundation of god's grace like never before seen in history 
we need to be ready to take advantage of that the very second it happens because that period of time that we're going to have to take advantage of it is probably going to be pretty short human psychology being what it is even the most extraordinary events the, the repercussions of that they only reverberate in someone's psyche for a few weeks several weeks maybe people are those who will not take advantage of the graces of the warning that mini judgment they're going to wander back into their old ways probably after several weeks if we don't gather them in yeah. in that and time. one thing that's coming to mind mm -hmm. right now is please if you're watching this i know it's hard and i know you might be rejected flat out but the more priests that are prepared the better for the whole yes. world because they need to get their confession imagine open. a priest reeling from seeing their own lives mm -hmm. having to suddenly sit down at the head of a confession line of thousands <laughs> so hand them the book they can at least look at the back cover and say hmm, i don't know about this at least a seed was planted right at least a seed or they may be like one of these priests and saying look at all the you know the mystics the saints many of whom have had the imprimatur who were told by God about this event. Mm -hmm. Look at the signs of the times. This may happen in our lifetime. So, okay, I'm a priest. Maybe I'll really take my soul seriously as well and think about how I would handle such a situation and not and be shocked and reeling and, and, and needing to tend to myself after even such an event. Even more than that, Christine, and I, I, you know, I think I shared this with, with your viewers, uh, Christine, on the, on your last program, but I can't remember is, is there's, uh, there's people might be going, wow, if this is so huge. Wouldn't it be in the Bible? Uh, I agree. In fact, you know, I, as I I've shared with people years ago, I heard this, this word in my heart, that there's a great storm coming upon the earth, like a hurricane. And a few days later, I sat down, I opened my Bible to revelation chapter six and I, I sense the Holy Spirit say in my heart, this is the great storm. And so I, for those, who, especially evangelicals, this is the warning. Have your, this your is Bibles the warning. Up, yeah. If you and read Matthew Revelation 24. chapter six, in chapter one, you, you or the first seal, there's seven seals that are broken. So I'm just going to whip through them real fast. The first seal is this rider on a white horse who has a crown and he, he wins victories. Um, one of the popes said he felt that was Jesus or another saint said the Holy Spirit. We're living since the early 30s somewhere. In that, we're probably in Fatima. We're living in a time of mercy. So we think that might be what that seal is. The second seal, a rider is given a, a red, a big, huge sword to take peace away from the world. So we can make all the arguments right now with nuclear weapons being loaded right now that we're very close to that seal being definitively broken. The third seal, this one I find extraordinary. Uh, when I wrote about it, I, I used the words, it's inflation because it, the, he describes this seal and you can only buy so much with, with a denarius, you know, so much wheat with a denarius. We're living right now in a moment of incredible hyperinflation around the world. The fourth seal, more sword, famine, and plague. And now we're seeing more viruses coming out. They're, they're naming the common cold, giving it new names, and everything, scaring everybody. And we're seeing anarchy in the streets. We're seeing murders increasing quite a bit, actually, in cities since the whole pandemic started. You get to the fifth seal, it's persecution, the martyrs underneath the, the altar crowd. How much longer? And the Lord says, a little bit longer. And then you hit the sixth seal. And if you read it, what the people sense, everybody, it says princes to paupers cry out. They think it's the day of judgment, but it's not. They cry out. They want the rocks to fall on them. Something happened. And this is interesting, Christine, because you mentioned the cross in the sky. They cry out that the that the lamb, the wrath of the lamb has come. And if you go back two chapters, St. John, when he saw the lamb, he said it looked like a crucified lamb. Very interesting. It's the Christ crucified. One of the seers, Jennifer, that was on our website, said the cross will appear. And from the wounds where Christ's wounds were, there will be light flowing to the earth for a short time. And then comes the eye of the storm, the seventh seal. I remember I was reading this and going, well, if this is the storm, there's got to be an eye of the storm. And sure enough, what does it say? The seventh seal says it's broke, opened and there's silence in heaven for half an hour. 
And then the next chapter, in between the sixth and the seventh, rather, what do we read? The angels go around the earth, marking the foreheads of those who are the servants of God. And God even tells them, don't no chastisements, don't touch the earth, the trees, the water, nothing until you've sealed the forehead. So basically, chapter six is all about chaos coming, some sort of chaos coming upon the earth that's, I believe, mostly man-made. And we're seeing that today. It is mostly man-made culminating in this supernatural moment where people have to make a choice and then God will mark their foreheads before then the ultimate chastisement comes, which we believe is, is really the person of the instrument the of purification will be the antichrist. I'll, so I'll read. Yeah. That's I'll what we've see. got. That's what we've got to look forward to. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but it, Glad we started but the it, show it, with <laughs> laughter. But, short range. but it's a message of hope short. because of what comes after the antichrist. Yeah which is the pr predominant theme in these prophecies. I mean, above all heaven, of course, but the preparation for heaven, which is the era on earth. It's going to happen is guaranteed. Those, I believe that if you persevere, you can see it with your own eyes. It's quite striking, Mark, to just, uh, so it's Revelation 6, everyone, verses 12 through 17. And St. John says, then I watched while he broke open the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. So we have many prophets talking about an earthquake accompanying this. The sun right, turned yeah. as black as dark sackcloth. Many mystics talk about darkness covering the earth. And the whole moon became like blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. Then the sky was divided like a torn scroll curling up and every mountain and island was moved from its place so we have a sense of lots of manifestations on the earth this is this is the wake-up call the kings of the earth the nobles the military officers the rich the powerful and every slave and free person hid themselves in caves and among mountain crags in other words mountain crags everyone so Whatever's happening in Revelation 6, every single person is affected and there's shame. There's a, a sense of, oh, I don't yes. want to see this. <laughs> this is not easy to see. They cried out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? And how many of us we've experienced, I believe every single person on earth with a conscience has experienced a moment where our sin is exposed, or we've mm -hmm. said something or done something stupid, and someone calls us on it in person or in public, and we have to stare at it, or we have this illumination of a sin inside of us, and we think, ah, oh, have I done? Mm -hmm. Or we see that we hurt someone, and it hurts. So this is a person's entire life being shown them and looking at the lamb, as Mark said, and wanting to, to hide. Yeah. And they're not even hiding. It's they're saying they're, they're begging the boulders to fall on, them, which is like saying, please kill me kill instead me. of, instead of letting me see my sin, because that's yes. the truth. If you knew how horrendous sin is, any physical pain would be far preferable to the infinite the infinite evil of a single sin against an infinitely good God. Mm -hmm. Now, thanks be to God, you still have a chance right now, watch whoever you are watching yeah. this, whatever time or day it is, you still have a chance to get all that sin wiped clean through confession. And then even if it is brought up in the warning, it'll be brought up in a completely different light. One, one of one, not of shame, like unforgiven, unrepented sin but of but in a different more glorious light and there still might be some purification to do yet but but it'll be completely different you will be so prepared if you just repent bring it to confession you know right now bring it directly to god yes but bring it to confession as soon as you can jesus can wipe it away instantly easily but you have to be willing you have to be willing to let go of those sins so many people I know, um, Christine, I'll get to you in one second, are always like, I can't wait for the warning because then my 
you know, divorced spouse will see the mistake he or she made. And then, and I can't wait for my alphabet soup child to see it. Cause then they'll know. And, and we're always, I'm seeing a lot of people talk about this person, that person, that person, I can't wait for them to see. And what occurred to me, I know recently I was in church and I started bawling because I thought of the sins that I've confessed and that I, that are in my mind, but then it started occurring to me. I'm 57 years old. What about all those sins that I've forgotten? And I have to look at even those. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that was a sin. Oh my gosh, I forgot. I think we need to kind of reset ourselves and realize it's not going to be easy on us who are prepared. And, mm. and I say that not to scare the heck out of you, but technically, yes, we should scare the hell out of all of us, right? But to say, live your life in a way today that is worthy of this calling, that is worthy of you having known about the warning. The, the harsh words that you would say to your spouse or the the um, cutting someone off on the road, road rage, all of that is not going to be forgotten by God. Live your life worthy so that when you stand before God on your warning, not even judgment day yet, right? That you can go, Lord, from the moment I found out about the warning, I tried to, to, to not sin at all in the slightest way. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there because this show isn't just for everybody else because all you guys watching it already know about the warning. Let's kind of reset ourselves. Absolutely. I would, I would just yeah, add and, to oh, on top of that. We keep oh, sorry. Christine I just off. wanted to mention to not oh, get ahead, away Christine. from it. For those of you who want to read more, uh, look at Matthew 24, 29, verses 29 to 31 speaking of the warning. And then uh, Father Jim Blunt surprised me and started reading parts of Psalm 97. And mm. you'll see the warning in there, which was interesting. very interesting. I can read that later if you want, but I don't want to interrupt you, Mark. Today's collect had a reference to the warning, but continue, Mark. Oh, I, I was just going to say on top I of I just that. really want to say... I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to interrupt you too, Mark, because everybody else did, so... Not, not just to prepare, in a sense... Uh, you know, like preparing, like I got to make sure I got all my sins confessed and I'm I'm so scared that I might have something I forgot. Like that is not the spirit with which Correct. to go forward at any moment of any day. Jesus is mercy himself. And the, the whole message of divine mercy is that even the greatest sinner has recourse to his mercy. And Jesus said, my heart is throbbing to just pour you my mercy over you. That's the heart of Jesus. Jesus isn't coming like you better be have your ducks in a row because the warning might kill you. You know, um, I think another thing is coming with the warning for those who are preparing. And that's going to be like a new Pentecost. Great blessings are going to come upon those who are preparing, which is why I believe our Lady has been saying, form these cenacles, upper rooms, all around the world, is to prepare your heart because she, her heart is imploring, as she did 2,000 years ago in the upper room, for the Holy Spirit to come with a new outpouring on the church. And I believe what is coming is going to be a great outpouring of the gift to be able to live in the divine will. I think that's going to be one of the prime graces. And it's not going to be so automatic because we still have to live in virtue and be faithful and, and desire to live in the divine will. But I feel that there's a great grace coming in which the kingdom of God will descend in a new way in believers to begin already living in the air of peace that will come in its fullness after the death of the Antichrist. So it don't just think of it See, I, for me, I'm I'm anticipating the warning. It's like, I don't want to miss those graces. That's why I'm preparing. Yeah. I want to fast and pray because I want to receive those blessings. And if you weren't in the upper room in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, you weren't there to see the fire fall. You weren't there to experience that first outpouring. Now, when Peter went in the streets, he, he proclaimed the gospel and they spoke in tongues and 3,000 people were converted that day. So it's not like others won't have the grace, but... There's an initial grace that God's want to give. And I want to be one of those apostles that goes out to the people and and, and proclaims the good news rather than be one who's caught off guard and, and be stumbling around trying to figure out what's going on. So that, that's yeah. all I wanted to add. Yeah, we don't want to miss this side. extraordinary opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's so positive. But at the same time, thinking of my kids, it's also the greatest threat because like a kid 
will in terms of punishments for you know you have to punish children when they misbehave mm -hmm. of course the worst punishment for a child is missing out on fun and then right. i'm not trying oh, to well. make this i'm not trying to make this you know about just fun but you, you are being invited to be one of the greatest evangelists in the history of the church yeah. by being prepared for the warning by having your soul ready to meet the lord and the, this is going up in advent this is the perfect time to think about this and pray on it the coming of the, the Lord in Christmas, the coming of the Lord in the era and the warning, it's all at the end of time and your judgment, it's it's all deeply linked. Yeah. But, you know, in my kids, they'll, they'll be the most apoplectic <laughs> and beside themselves if their punishment is they can't go out and have a bunch of fun with their friends or cousins or something when everyone else is having a blast. Yeah. And really, it's the same with us because we're all just big kids, if, if you think about it. The, the worst pain is when we see that others are, are, are taking some opportunity that we're missing out on right. and we're going to be that's going to be horrible so don't be one of those people who's looking at all those others ready for this outpouring of graces ready to, to to live in the divine will and do god's will and get out there and proclaim be ready <laughs> to just explode in his and world. have fun like mark is doing <laughs> look i just <laughs> looked at the clock and i could talk to you guys forever <laughs> But let's let I'm going to wrap this up by asking you each to to answer how I always um, end my shows. Name one thing you would have our listeners do differently as a result of something they heard today. Um, let me start with Mark and then Daniel and then Christine. Name one thing you'd have our listeners do differently. Oh, boy. How can I tie that into the word that's on my heart? OK, because I've been wanting to talk about this the whole show. Uh, OK, so this is this is the one thing. You have to let go of your life. You have mm. to you have to let go of your life. You go ahead and grieve, but you have to let go of this era. Let go of everything you know and that you've been holding on to and that we've been enjoying because they're telling us you by the end by 2030 you'll own nothing and and you'll supposedly be happy. So Jesus himself said, unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. And what does it profit a man, he said, to gain the whole world and yet lose himself? If you wish to be my disciple, he said, pick up your cross and follow me and renounce your possessions. So this is a perennial gospel, but right now we're being called to live it in an extraordinary moment in the history of the church, where all the popes of the past century and Our Lady has been appearing for over a century all over the world, preparing us for this. This is not normal. Okay. So that's the first thing. Let go. Now, some of you are thinking about refugees and go, oh, well, God's going to protect me in a refuge. I don't know that. You might be called the martyrdom, which is even more glorious than living in a refuge. Trust me. It, you have to let go. And enter into the moment of being a disciple of Jesus now. You want to wait till the warning to convert your husband? God says, what are you waiting for? Because you tonight, in your sleep, you might die. So today, be a witness to your husband or your wife or your children who are lost. Be today, be the evangelist. As Father Michel said, and Father Michel, and I, I'll try to keep all of this short because there's two, three other people on the show, but Father Michel is a seer that we're discerning on Countdown to the Kingdom, probably the most controversial one, and I, I would agree with that. And I'm still, I'm neutral. I, do, I don't know what to think of Father Michel, other than I think he's a beautiful, humble soul, and that much I think everybody has gathered yes. from him, despite some of his really, you know, I think radical claims and so on that we, we that may or may not be true. We'll find out. But regarding refuges, we've taken a lot of criticism on Countdown of the Kingdom, which I don't understand because biblically and also in the church fathers, they affirm the existence that in these times there will be refuges or what they called solitudes, where God will separate his people to protect them. But let's go to Father Michel for just a moment because I think he has the best and most balanced comment regarding refuges. He said, the refuge first of all, is you. Before it is a place, it is a person, a person living with the Holy Spirit in a state of grace. A refuge begins with the person who has committed her soul, her body, her being, her morality, according to the word of the Lord, the teachings of the church, and the law of the Ten Commandments. That is beautiful. And the perfect description of a refuge is to be totally sold out for God now, following him without reserve, without question, without hanging on to your life. And as, as Daniel said earlier, 
it's prudent to store up some food and water, given that there, there's a man-made famine coming at us in our faces. But how much should you store up? I was like four months in a day, four months in 12 days, 35 days. You have to let go and say, yes. Jesus, I trust, I trust in, you. in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And more than that, Jesus, I will follow you now. I will be your witness today. I won't wait for the warning. I won't wait for nothing. Today, I will love my wife and my kids. I will give them a glimpse of your love, of your goodness. So yeah. that's my advice to your listeners. Yeah. Let go of everything and when you let go of everything then you will have everything because then you'll have jesus so what i got from that is yeah. you husbands will say so i will let go and hand the credit card to my wife is that is that what you heard too christine <laughs> that, is that the cliff notes of it no that was it <laughs> I, I think i said that didn't i <laughs> yeah that was it there yeah it was oh, brilliant console. no i that was wow you know i was listening and just going wow you're right yeah. Put Daniel. it in the rear view mirror. Put it all in the rear view mirror. Who knows rear what the future view. holds? Yeah. I, I, man, uh, so many things I'd like to say, but I would leave it as the next time, really every time, but especially the next time you're in a situation that's that tempts you to anxiety or fear, or maybe it's just painful, remind yourself, and I'm quoting St. Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the church here. He says, it is certain and of faith, meaning you're a heretic if you if you reject this. It is certain and of faith that nothing but God's will can happen. And the next time you're in that situation, you remind yourself of that, and then you say, Jesus, I trust in you. Thy will be done. I give you my will. Please give me yours in return. No matter the situation, fear, anxiety, pain, whatever, remind yourself of that and say those words. And then pray the rosary every day. Amen. That's, those are my, that's my advice. Bye. Thank you. Christine. Well, of course, there's taking advantage of the sacraments while we still have them, right? That's something else coming down the pike is not having access. So going to mass as often as you practically can. Confession very often um, in once a month is, is a great plan to have. Padre Pio said once a week, a room gets dusty once a week and needs to be swept away. Swept. And then you guys rosary. have been. Oh, oh, hey, I thought you're done. Hey, I, got, I got a lot of wisdom here. <laughs> um, <laughs> then we have the rosary, of course, and prayer from the heart. And what came to mind is a final thing to say, uh, even more than all that, believe it or not, <clears throat> is. To have a personal relationship with Jesus, a heart to heart relationship Amen. where one cultivates, how does Jesus speak to me? How do I communicate with him? Because in the coming days, we all have to be that minimal, as it were, type of mystic, because he may say, go left, whereas the evil one is saying, go right in any given moment. And if we don't know what his voice is for us, and we've never cultivated a personal, loving, conversational relationship with him, we could be swept away. So begin now. Yes, do all the Catholic prayers, receive the sacraments, but realize if I'm just doing this in a manner where I don't really think I have a personal relationship with Jesus, it's time to beg him for one. This has been amazing. And I would love it if we could do this again sometime because there is so much more that I know you guys wanted to say. And I know my viewers will be just thinking, thank you. Thank you for the food. We have to be community. We have to feed one another. We may be small, um, but I know all of four of us hope that we are part of God's remnant. You know, I, I, I beg God that I am in that, that group, but we want to encourage all of you to just keep going forward, to just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, to you're going to make mistakes. You're going to miscommunicate. You're not going to hear things correctly, but if you are keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus and every day doing, you know, uh, what, what all of them said, but Lord, give me your will, give me your direction. Let, let me, I always say, Lord, give me the graces 
give me the graces to do your will, because right now, if you leave me to my flesh, I'm failing. So um, we're going to put all of your websites at the bottom of here. So everyone knows. I know for me, I'd love for you guys to share the show with as many people as you can. Breakfastwithbacon.com. And it may not be on this social media. Most of you are watching me on the social media channel. Go to my website, breakfastwithbacon.com. Daniel and I did a show a long time ago, talked about uh, these will be shut down soon and you need to be able to sign up for each person's separate page. Go to Christine's page, go to the nowword.com for Mark. Who, um, you guys, can you say quick what website or way that they want to get a hold of you or find you? Uh, I should say a uh, queen of peace media.com. Thank you. And mine is DSD O'Connor.com. And mine is the nowword.com. Excellent. And those will all be on the links right below the show here, but go and register for any newsletters for, um, so that you can find it, but be proactive. Do not be reactive. Go and search for the information that the Lord is trying to give you every single moment of our lives. We will be accountable for. So I'm just, you know, asking the Lord, give me the energy, give me the strength to do all that you have me to do and not, not be slothful or, or, you know, just to sit back, but rest as you need to rest and to get out there and do what God needs for you to do. All right, guys, you are, you are awesome. I hope I can get you back in here. Do you remember how we end my show? Something about medium poached eggs. <laughs> we're, scrambled, we're scrambled, scrambled, hard, hard boiled. No. High okay. five to the world. <laughs> high, five. high five to the world. Christine poached it eggs. <laughs> and you know, when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I'd hold my belly and people would say, what are you going to name it? And I straight face. So, well, if it's a girl, I'm going to name her middle name, Anne, and her first name, eggs, eggs and bacon. And people would go, <laughs> I kept a straight face as long as I could. I was like, eggs and no. Bacon. I love it. Yeah, but on that note, I am it. Dr. Christine Bacon. You've been watching Breakfast with Bacon. And I'd like to remind you always to live your life. Sunny side up. What he said. Daniel Williams. <laughs> <laughs>